Hello, and welcome to the Create and Crowbar, a podcast all about video games. This is episode 427, being recorded on the 26th of October. I'm the wildly successful Brian Michael Bendis created Croton and Crowbar reimagining Jamie Britton. <laughs> joining, me, joining me this week is a man who has spent the last several days locked in a fearsome battle with an alien symbiote for control of his own body. It's Mr. Tom Senior. And it's been, it's been a good time, Jamie. Uh, I've got to say, it's been a very enjoyable time. <laughs> how's, that, how's that black suit work, working out? Obviously, your traditional red suit has been hung up for the time being. Yeah, well, I mean... You know. I, personality uh, blackens and, <laughs> and you start I, becoming more emo i i just love to become just to fight you know physical personification of the worst aspects of my personality like that is i'm just quite into that as an idea so uh, yeah i'm pretty cool with it and uh, as yeah, we're in, talking uh, about hanging out in, in jazz piano um bars oh, doing some oh e- yes. evil dancing <laughs> do some court you know street dancing uh yeah. do some twirls uh do some very weird uh toby Maguire winks at uh women who did not ask for the attention uh all of all of the terrible terrible things that have <laughs> happened uh, as a result of the venom spider-man uh you know moments in the film and games across the years Skip you know how Toby Toby Maguire, when he was in the nineties, like a pre Spidey Toby Maguire was in a was in a group with people like um, Leonardo DiCaprio and David Blaine, I think as well. David and Blaine, very, really? yeah, very, yeah, it's weird. And they called themselves. I don't, I don't. I might say it once, and then I won't say it again. They called themselves the Pussy Posse, and I'm not going to oh, say that again no. because that is that is a, not a nice That's way to good. talk about anything really let alone posses which is generally such a, a charming <laughs> it's an awful combination of words isn't it uh, it's the, it really is you really you really re, you really never want to find yourself in that kind of posse <laughs> like, um, you should it's, it's like um the sort of mitchell webb sketch where they've got skulls on their caps and they're in the middle of a war and they turn to each other and say and have you noticed that we've got skull and crossbones on our caps are we the bad guys yeah uh, it's, it's, if it's true are that, we the baddies moment that i think it, if you're in, in a pissy pussy there's actually a really terrible movie that they made called don's plum which you can watch on youtube oh my god <laughs> which i don't even is... want to ask much more about what <laughs> oh, no i can't resist what is it about <laughs> it's not really about anything it's sort of an indie movie that they made oh, right, right sort of before they were all famous or just afterwards and then after titanic got big like someone sort of picked up the footage right but it's, it's it's basically them playing like hyper like toxic max masculine like clearly like very based on their own personalities it's got this mm. one scene where like leonardo dicaprio improvises like just completely railing out his girlfriend and being horrible to her in front of a big room full of people which is clearly just what he thinks about that woman <laughs> Yeah, it's horrible. I don't. I don't recommend it. Anyway, the reason I bring it up is because I think to- emo Toby Maguire in Spider Man Three he's channeling um, that energy. I think he's. I think that's the closest he's ever been to portraying his true self on screen. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the Cider House Rules or any of his other things. It was. Uh, it was this. It one. wasn't Cider House Rules. <laughs> was he? In, was he in that? Anyway, getting derailed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah anyway so uh yes it's it's nice to be here on the old uh pod i think we'll get to the um spidermans in a minute but i'm gonna mm. do i'm just gonna want to talk briefly now about something which is entirely based on my own desire to have more people to talk to about something <laughs> so uh, a nintendo direct a couple of weeks ago in japan they announced um shirin the wanderer six um mm which is called um, Shuren the Wanderer, the Mystery Dungeon of Serpent Coil Island. And then it didn't re- that news didn't really filter across to the Western Nintendo Directs because they didn't include it in that one oh. um, until more recently. Um, so, um, yeah, that was a weird one because uh, it's a super exciting thing for me because the Shuren games, if you've listened to the... Um, uh, roguelike traditional roguelike episode that we did of this podcast you'll hear me naffing on about the Sheeran games um while uh, uh graham and marsh sound increasingly alarmed <laughs> <laughs> about how, quite how into those games i am so what they are is briefly is um the kind of japanese arm of roguelikes traditional roguelikes so um they have these mystery dungeon series which they've released kind of dribs and drabs of over the last 20, 25 years. Sheer and the Wanderer being the kind of shining jewel in it. These very beautiful, um, very characterful, very distinct games 
um, which are very traditional roguelike experiences, but have this kind of wonderful JRPG shimmer over them, beautiful music. And then they always have like a kind of story dungeon, which is the sort of basically the tutorial for the game, even though it will take you like 50 completely grueling hours to complete. And then they have Mm. all of these optional dungeons, which is the majority of the game. And so the last game they released was Shiran 5, which I think his full title is the the Tower of Fortune and the Tower of Fate or the Dice of Fortune. It's got a ridiculously long title. Um, But that is the one that I first played because they released it on Switch a couple of years ago. But that Mm. came originally came out for the DS in 2010. So it's been ages since a mainline Sheeran game has come out, even though they've periodically, um, it's Spike Chunsoft uh, who make it, they've periodically updated it and added to it as the different versions have, have come along. But like that is a game I've spent hundreds and hundreds of hours with over the last couple of years in particular. Um, and it's just a wonderful game full of so much kind of magic, really. And it feels like a recognizable roguelike experience, but it has all of this like character that they've built in over there, like really individual character that they've built in over the years. Um, so the announcement of a new one is just completely brilliant and so exciting. Um and uh, it looks really interesting. It's they, They've sort of said it's back to basics, which is kind of an interesting thing for them to say because even in its original form on the NES, the game is like wildly complicated. So to say back to basics is kind of like, okay, what do you mean by that? That's a weird thing to say. <laughs> the, uh, the other thing I've heard is that it doesn't have the night cycle in it. I realize I'm totally nerding out here. You just have to bear with me. In Sheeran 5, they have a day-night cycle. So basically at, at certain points... Uh, day will turn to night and you'll have to sort of change from using your weapons and swords and all that sort of stuff into using abilities, which are all these kind of mad powers that you use. Um, And I think it was considered quite controversial by the Sheeran community, who are wonderful, by the way. I I encourage anyone to find them on Discord. They're just some of the nicest, maddest bunch of nerd I've ever met. Um, But that was kind of controversial for them because it sort of changes play quite a lot because you end up with this kind of... Uh, alternating styles of play coming in rather than the sort of pure Sheeran. So that's gone now. That's one of the main things that they've mentioned. Uh, right. It's also got a, like a proper uh, 3D art style, which is kind of jarring if you've played as much of the kind of lovely 2D, um, you know, Final Fantasy VI vibes of Sheeran V, um, although they have done 3D stuff before on the on the Wii version, which I haven't played, but still... It looks kind of interesting. Anyway, I'm just super excited about it. I think a new Sheeran game is just, yeah, like a really exciting prospect. I might like become a YouTuber <laughs> or do some streaming just to sort of talk about it because oh, that's cool. There really is very little um, to be uh, to be found about that stuff on on YouTube. Really, um, it's really big in Japan. Like someone sent me the the link to um, search on Twitch for. Japanese um, Sheeran streamers because there's always people doing it because it's such a kind of endlessly complicated huh. uh, game. So there's loads of that and it's always really fun to pop into those rooms. Um, yeah. Anyway, I digress. I, I'm just I'm super excited about that game. I want to get other people excited about that game. I've been natting on about it on the Crate and Crowbar Discord for years now and occasionally someone will say, you know what, Jamie, I'm going to take your advice. I'm going to play Sheeran the Wanderer 5. Uh, and they then I never, never hear seen again. again. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever comes back and says, "Oh, I'm so glad I did." <laughs> Consumed by the game completely. <laughs> so it's yeah, always I Halloween, just... so yeah, I think that's <laughs> absolutely good, good option for this um, weekend. So yeah, uh, that was just a heads up on that game. I think it's coming out in February uh, next year. Oh, cool! Um, so plenty of time to play all the other five million games, um, which are coming, still seem to be coming out. Um, one of which, Tom, uh, I'm very excited to hear about because uh, I think on one of the earliest game pods I did review, we talked about um, the original Spidey, uh, Marvel Spider-Man. Uh, so you've been playing Marvel Spider-Man 2. Yeah, so it feels more like Marvel Spider-Man 3 because the Miles Morales exp- uh, expansion kind of felt like a really good sequel to the first game and really sort of filled it out and um, accomplished uh, a lot of kind of um extra it filled in the gaps that was left by a pretty straightforward telling of the spider-man story uh with spider-man as peter parker whereas actually uh modern spider-man is there are lots of spider-men 
and spider women and spider horses and spider pigs and a whole multiverse of uh amazing uh quite funny spider things uh you know uh, and it was like this one you get to flip between peter parker and miles morales um peter is like uh, at the age of 25 a veteran <laughs> of the superhero universe because that's how the superheroes work as soon as they get to 30 they just sort of vanish <laughs> and uh, are never seen again um and then uh miles i think is about 17 or something and he's sort of like applying for college and um they they're both the great thing about spider-man uh perhaps like one of the reasons why I sort of prefer this game to, for example, the Batman Arkham games, which are a huge influence for, for these games, um, is that Spider-Man as a character is fundamentally a nice person rooted in their community in whatever guise or multiverse they're, they're, they're based in. Um, so Peter looks after his Aunt, Aunt May and his family. Uh, Miles is kind of helping out with, like... Um, his mum's a, a, a city councillor and he's helping her out with like uh, solving problems and uh, attending community meetings. Uh, there's a brilliant mission, for example, like like Charlie Parker's saxophone has been stolen and you have to rescue it and return it to a museum. <laughs> it's just a, uh, uh, it's rooted in like actual communities within New York City, which is where the oh entire my God, I think that set. might be the, I think that might be the best idea for a mission I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> it's, it's like, uh, I think what I would say is that, um, the the game is basically a third person um, brawler, open city brawler, uh, where you basically uh, jet between locations, beat up literally hundreds of dudes, um, uh, and they're all interchangeable, very similar sort of uh, character archetypes. Lots of you know spectacular flips and little cutscenes, um, and then uh, and it's very much in the Arkham style where it's like a big counter system. You get big icons appearing above people's heads when you need to press a button at a certain t- points to defeat them um and all of that stuff is just it, there's nothing new in the game like everything in spider-man 2 has been done before but there is the charm of the spider-man universe that are backing it up uh, that uh i'm at, like, i have to confess i've been a fan of spider-man since i was a child and i think that feeds a lot into how much you're going to enjoy the game uh, because it's very much playing with uh, the Spider-Man archetypes and also uh, the amazing list of quite you know deeply underwhelming villains that Spider-Man has to face <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. on, on a daily basis. Um, the great thing about the Arkham game is that Batman uh, has fantastic villains. Even the stupid ones are really kind of weird and interesting. Um Whereas most of Spider-Man's uh, opponents are just kind of like, what if an animal uh, was also a person? <laughs> uh, so you, you, you fight the scorpion, you fight like other versions of spiders and things like that. Uh, and and the, uh, the main sort of like intro villain for this one is a guy called Craven, who's a master hunter. And he's actually one of the, I would say one of the least interesting spider-man villains that you could choose <laughs> to to lead a game um or he's just uh he's got a death wish and he wants to fight the the biggest baddest things on the planet before he dies and uh, ideally die in combat fighting uh, you know, the greatest predator in the universe um fortunately as as has been like revealed and extensively trailered um the uh, spider-man's best villain venom is uh, a huge part of the game uh venom is a, a gooey alien symbiote that uh, gets into your body and uh, you wear it as a suit uh, and it makes you super, super powerful. Um, but then also over time, it makes you uh, a twat. <laughs> it's kind of fundamentally how that works. <laughs> um, uh, you Can I get... pause you for a second? Did you yes. say that Craven the Hunter, is that his name, Craven? Yes, yes, it is. is K, with a K. Trying... <laughs> with a K, yeah. <laughs> is he trying to hunt the world's greatest predators? Is, is that Spider-Man? Is that what he's trying to do? Is that the like world's most dangerous game? Is no, uh, he doesn't realise it? It's what literally? There's literally a cutscene at the very, very start of the game where he's in a jungle and I think he just messes up a tiger or something, um, right. and then someone shows him an iPad with New York with loads of sort of like <laughs> arrows pointed to different villains spread throughout all of the districts, and he's like, "Take me there now." <laughs> You're just imagining like with those diagrams of a food chain, and it's like, yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> Will the beast, and then <laughs> tiger, and then Spider Man, and then lion. <laughs> it's it's so like he's 
he's he's one of the he's one of the worst villains that Spider Man has, and it's kind of bold for them to lead so hard with him. And you fight like he's got hordes and hordes of supporters who who are basically like trying to find the predator that will kill him. And like, there's no evidence that they're being paid. There's no motivation behind the like their action. Oh, it's just, it just makes no sense. It, all right, it's kind of gibberish. That that aspect of it is gibberish. The good stuff is the venom stuff, as always, because um, you gets to you know you get to see the worst aspects of each character as they're infected by this thing, uh, and how you know comic books often work is that you recycle villains and you you know uh, venom could be. Uh, each one of Peter's friends, Peter himself, uh, a random uh, journalist called Brock. You know, uh, you, you get to sort of tell different stories with the same mechanic, um, which is perfect for video games. Very good for video games because you could just reset at any po- any point, and um, the the horrible little gooey Venom symbiote can slide out of Peter and into a different character. Uh, and uh, what ends up happening is that you get into these boss fights um, that are like quite intense kind of Batman Arkham style um, punch counter, lots of really good traversal. I'll talk about the traversal in a minute. It's amazing. Uh, but actually they're, they're sort of extended, very, very intense therapy sessions. <laughs> the character that you're playing as <laughs> like, they're really working out some stuff in those fights that, and it's, it's almost like a, a kind of anime level of just screaming at each other where, uh, and sometimes like the, the villains obviously, uh, psychologically torture uh, poor Miles, for example, in, in one particular fight, and they're saying, "Ah, oh, your mother was always ashamed of you, and you could never, you will never be able to save her, and she'll never believe in you." And then he's like, "I respectfully disagree," <laughs> and it, it, there's a b- <laughs> back and forth on that level for like twenty minutes as you're <laughs> desperately dodging, trying to web this thing up and like pin it down and then punch it to death. Um, uh, and in the end, it's like the 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 denouement for these fights is never like, oh, I have obtained victory, and that feels great. It's always like, I'm a bit more sad now uh, than when I started this fight <laughs> because <laughs> um, even though I've won, uh, humanity has lost. <laughs> yes, you've, uh, won that's the, f- you've won the physical fight, but someone else has won the psychotherapeutic upper it, hand. Ab- absolutely right, and it's like, oh no, there's not going to be a second session because you're in prison now, or I've webbed you <laughs> to a, an aeroplane that's shot off into the sun, or something. That doesn't actually happen, but you know, it's the sort of thing that could happen in a Spider-Man story. Um, <laughs> I feel uh, like this uh, is where we should. Dro- we don't have adverts, but this is where we drop in the better help advert, isn't it? Like, <laughs> yeah. God, I've been hearing so many of them across all the podcasts God, I listen to. Just, please shut up, better help. Um, obviously, everyone should get mental help with their mental health in any way they can. However, I slightly suspect that app. One thing I mm. liked about Venom generally is like the cool thing about Venom, I think, the sort of fundamentally cool thing about him is that it's a uh, insidious, you know, the idea of it being a symbiote, you know, it, that it kind of slowly corrupts you gradually. I, mm. I always thought that that was a very very cool idea you know that it can it it turns you evil so slowly you don't notice it happening yeah. until it's too late that's a i mean it's it's very todd mcfarlane uh <laughs> but in spawn you know, type, yeah. yeah spawn kind of good vibes but like it's great i think and uh i always i always responded well to a to a venom story i think it's, it's, it, they're always, for me the best Spider-Man stories are the Venom stories, um, and it's because uh, the relationship goes both ways, as you know, Symbiote suggests. Um, like Venom picks up the ideas and passions of the things that it, it infects, as much as it pours its hatred and kind of gradual corruption into the, the you know the hosts that it's occupying. Um, and that's really quite well done in this game. Uh, I actually think it's a really good Spider-Man story, and it's um, delivered uh, particularly well by the voice actor playing Peter Parker. Who, I'm afraid I don't have the, his name to hand, but um, he just gradually sounds more petulant and furious. And it's done bit by bit over the course of uh, like probably five, ten hours. They've really like paced out how uh, his kind of outbursts when they come out the frequency um his general tone how he feels like more and more hard done by and he ends up being a kind of like almost uh obviously he pushes everyone around him away but it, almost a kind of like furious incel figure before he finally you know obviously 
the the symbiote moves around so you know uh, it comes and goes but i think we uh, talked about it when we were talking about the last game that like one of the and it's the same with the arkham games is one of the joys of these games is like them retelling stories that they know that basically everyone like knows how it's going how it's going to turn out basically yeah. you know? and like i imagine i haven't played this game but i imagine there's a lot of like joy to be had funnily enough in in like the game acknowledging that you're going to know that the venom symbiote is going to be doing something to him and then you get to kind of be, you get that kind of front row seat at the kind of spectacle of that. And, and you're able to kind of pick up on things and sort of question whether it's, you know, whether it's Peter or the symbiote doing the talking in a in a given moment. Yeah, it, that's a really good point. Because the, I think that among Marvel fans, certainly, there'll be like a built-in knowledge of how Venom works and how those stories tend to play out. Uh, so there's a sort of baseline understanding but you could be very playful on top of that. And Venom, like, moving to a different character and have, seeing how that affects them and how what their inner... It brings out the sort of inner bitterness of anything it infects, um, which is a, a kind of a, a, such a cool idea for uh, a game uh, and, a, you know, a comic book series and a, a character that's fundamentally about punching things until they stop <laughs> it's actually really interesting to uh see uh, you know oh i've not seen venom in fact this particular character before and actually what are their sort of deepest darkest hatreds like what what, what are their sort of deeply buried things that they sort of don't uh, obsess over normally but now has come to consume them over, over time and that's definitely uh played into really well in the story of spider-man 2 um but i'd also say that uh you uh, half the time you play as Miles Morales, and he's just a fantastic character. Just uh, the great thing about Spider Man is that whoever, as I said before, that whoever Spider Man is, like they're fundamentally pretty good people, <laughs> like nice people uh, who care for people. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things the game is really careful to do is to show you, even in cutscenes uh, and also through mission objectives, just saving people all the time. Uh, just every few minutes, you're rescuing someone. Uh, skirting them across the city, putting them on a uh, hospital bed or uh, into the back of an ambulance. Um, And that's kind of, there's no cynicism to it. I think that's what's kind of important about Spider-Man is that it should be like naively uh, optimistic about the human spirit. (laughs) It sounds like quite a big thing to say for for a superhero thing. But I think fundamentally that is what's always drew me to Spider-Man more than uh, as much as I love Batman. I've read read Spawn comics and they're they're really good fun, but the the ones I actually really like, uh, it always comes back to Spider-Man really. Fantastic. I'm hoping it has like lots of the the big uh, spectacular set pieces I thought were some of the the great bits of the uh, first game as well. It does. Um, and actually, I did mean to uh, mention the traversal, which was incredible in the first game, uh, which is just simply moving around by web slinging. Uh, in this game, you've got, you can press triangle and you open uh, up little web wings so you can swoop oh through the streets goodness. of New York. You can fly. You can fly in this game. Uh, and then like a spider start... does. I mean, spiders do like <laughs> fly around on the breeze. I think it's something they can do. So I think, I think there's probably a few species. But uh, having said that, like Miles Morales can turn invisible and um, punch people with electricity. And I'm not sure that's. Uh, I don't think. I don't think the Spider Kingdom has, the, <laughs> has those uh, particular abilities. Well, that we that we know of, they're invisible. So that's a good <laughs> point. It's a very good point. I'm a bit scared now. <laughs> uh, so uh, moving around in this game is just remarkable i absolutely love it um there are so so many different sort of maneuvers that you can uh pull uh you can even just like hold down square and push directions to do tricks in midair so yeah like tricks i was like exactly <laughs> yeah that's right so you can subsort and spin around and um i look a thing that just lets you just turn right angles super fast and then you could vault off uh lamp posts and uh, just uh there's it's really carefully observed so it, when you're swinging, if you release early and press X at the same time, you'll move straight on and with greater momentum. Uh, but if you let yourself sweep right up to the top of the arc and then press X, you'll soar high into the air. And then, of course, you can activate your wing, wingsuit and swoop down. It's different. Uh, and there are slip streams that you can go into that speed you up like twice as fast. Uh, it's just, um, it feels incredible. <laughs> like, uh, 
I dipped into the first game over and over again just to swing around, and it's better in this game, uh, in part because uh, they've actually, it's just, it's, in terms of technology, uh, it, the game is able to uh, render this incredibly beautiful city at such a speed that you, your character is allowed to be faster. Uh, so in the very, very first big sort of uh, fight of the game, the big opening sequence, uh, a boss will punt you literally halfway across the city. And <laughs> you're, you're, f- you're flying backwards out of a huge sand cloud into uh, a sunset and then across you know, past skyscrapers, and then back into Brooklyn, and then you're swinging back. And it all just renders instantly and effortlessly. And it's just extraordinary. It's an absolutely beautiful game. Um, and they play with this all the time. That there are little portals you can uh, take into, uh, you know, of, again another C list. Uh, Spider Man villain is like Mysterio, and he's got like little portals that let you sort of zoom in and do some fighting, and then zoom back out again. Uh, the it's something that so this is made by Insomniac uh, Games, and it's something they did often with uh, Ratchet and Clank. A Rift Apart, which was a launch title for the PS5, yeah. uh, which has a similarly sort of splendid degree of like spectacle, speed, and the ability to move between environments. Um, and they've just replicated that beautifully in a Spider Man context. And uh, that is a joy. I love it. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? How how much of a next gen feature that has become, like mm. being able to harness that properly. Because, you know, previous generations, that was one of the main limitations was streaming in landscapes quick enough for stuff like superheroes and fast cars to to uh, to do it. And so, yeah, when you see it, it's immediately, you know, uh, immediately uh, compelling, isn't it? <laughs> it is, because I, before, that would be a cutscene that you couldn't interact with. And it would yeah. just be a, something that just happens to you or it loads, uh, you know, back uh, way back in the day, loads an FMV or something to yeah. make it happen whereas now like as you're flying back you can actually start to traverse to try and mm. get back to the fight again um it's clearly just still uh the movement of your character the way the world around you is operating is still clearly being rendered within the rules of the game uh and so it feels much more to me like you're sort of part of it it's uh i think it's not to be underestimated um yeah. I think I had my first kind of holy shit ray tracing moments with um, Miles Morales actually, mm. just because that's sort of set in you know a sort of snowy version of the of New York that's not in the kind of base game and and you know the way that the kind of late day like light would kind of shine through the you know the city streets is just amazing. I mean, just yeah. amazing the way they've recreated that and if you if you've gone to new york if you've visited new york and if you've visited new york in the snow it's exactly like that the feel oh, of it is just you know extraordinary really it's such a, i'm sure it's, it's even a, more even more fidelity in it now in, in spider-man 2 yeah it's so much romance to it like um it uh, like um as you go from mission to mission you're switching between characters constantly which is also a really good thing uh, and each character's skill tree is really intelligently designed um so miles is immediately uh, as far as i've experienced it more powerful than peter like he's got mm. more interesting abilities but when the symbiote comes peter suddenly gets a burst of and then so he plays peter and he's suddenly the more powerful one um and it, there's actually they've built uh, the, the story is built into the actual mechanical progression of your characters in an RPG context, mm. uh, which is to be much admired, I think. Uh, and it's one of the undersung kind of best bits of the game, even though I think, I think people have kind of like filed it as way uh, away as being a, like quite a, like a derivative and stayed version of this sort of thing, this sort of game that uh, lots of studios will probably make over the, over the years. But I really admire the artistry and the attention to detail uh, the fantastic suit design and combat, like animation uh, in particular, um, like Insomniac games are fantastic. I, I really I'll play everything that they make, <laughs> basically. Yeah, and just as uh, as a check-in, I think we do this every time we speak. They're making a Wolverine game. Uh, yeah, that's gonna be interesting. It's gonna be awesome. That's, that uh, should be awesome. I wonder what they'll do with the violence. That's always the problem <laughs> with Wolverine. Like. Do you want to go like the film Logan or do you want to sort of? 
Well, it's like, do you want to yeah, go? Yeah. Do you want to go like the film Logan, or do you just want to not fucking bother making a Wolverine game? Because for me, <laughs> if yeah, I'm playing what Wolverine, do, I am definitely needing to go full Logan. You know, like, you've got X, to right. X Men Two, like, did he stab him through the heart just then? Ambiguity just won't cut the mustard. Yeah, no, me. I agree with that. I do agree. I think you've got to go all in. Yeah, if they have to have like robots or you know cybernetic aliens or something that is fine i don't mm. need to see you know humans <laughs> human beings <laughs> torn limb from limb um I'll, I'll be fine with aliens but i definitely need to you know be doing some slashy slashy heads off um as much as possible the violence is part of his character i think violence violence being short and hairy and uh, having <laughs> having like mostly chase relationships with much younger women oh <laughs> um, uh, yeah <laughs> it'd be cool if they had jubilee in the game or kitty yeah. pride as just before we move on from talking about spider-man how many mm. of venom's children can you name uh <laughs> i've got a list of them in front of me here which it just made me laugh earlier. that's interesting so there's there are spin-offs to the symbiote and some of them are set up and i don't want to spoil it but I could. I didn't know. If they, are they children? Yes, children. Yeah. So he's he's depicted as having spawned several children. One of them is very famous, which is Carnage, and then yes, yeah. uh, the other ones are called, and they're very good. Um, like um, metal album names. Cool. Uh, they are called Scream, Lasher, Phage, Agony, Riot, Mania, and Sleeper. Oh. I just, I just, Sleeper, <laughs> sleeper. Like, I know, yeah. like the worst seven dwarves <laughs> you could could see. Yeah, of. yeah, yeah. Sleeper, poor sleeper. Um, um, I I would say that uh, I uh, one or two of those might appear in this game or be teased. Do you sure. remember Phage? Look, I'm just going to click on What's Phage on Wikipedia. Here what is Phage? No, I've not heard of that one. Phage. Yeah. Obviously, Carnage is the most famous one. Yeah, he supports. He's a spiky one. <laughs> <laughs> he's a spiky, he's a spiky. spiky symbiote. Um, anyway, I, I can't just read out the Wikipedia for um, you, Venom's children. <laughs> as another like quick uh, movie spin off, have you seen the men, the Venom movies at all? I saw the first one. I thought it was bad. Uh huh. Yep. In a, in a bad way because I, I I spoke to a couple of people who thought it was bad in a good way, and I just thought it was bad in a bad way. Um, the second one is bad in a very bad way. Like as right. in. Okay. A Blair Witch Two Book of Shadows sort of actually, just... <laughs> and that's got Carnage in it. And Carnage normally should be quite interesting. Who plays Carnage? Let's go to Wikipedia. This is it's, this is my um, thing on the podcast. Tom. It's a true detective guy. Uh, sorry, Woody Harrelson. My yes. goodness. Yeah, yeah. He hams it up as much as possible. Like he just chews the scenery until it's gone, uh, and that's the most fun part of it. Really, like he's. It, there's sort of like weird sort of Bonnie and Clyde thing where he's rolling around with his girlfriend in a, a like a a limousine, um, causing my goodness. Carnage. It's directed directed by Andy Serkis, Gollum yeah, himself. For some reason, yeah, um, bonkers, uh, absolutely bonkers combination of influences. <laughs> uh, and it's only like ninety minutes long, but it's deeply boring at the same time, which is wow, yeah. unfortunate. <laughs> Well, yep, that's that's Marvel uh, movies, and that's, and that's um that's Tom Tom Hardy as well. He's, I like I like to see Tom Hardy. He's good, but uh, it, it, I don't know. It's a very strange. Rolfer. Did you see they were talk? <laughs> did you see Patrick Stewart slamming Tom Hardy in his uh, recently released memoir? Oh no, really? Yeah, just saying that when they made that terrible movie Nemesis. Oh yeah, that, that Tom Hardy was just a dick and no one liked him when he wouldn't come out of his trailer. <laughs> was he was he pretending to be Method or something like? Um, yeah, maybe. I mean, it's a weird thing to be method about playing a kind of Romulan created clone of John. Full method on that. One of my favourite awesome. um, comments I've ever seen in an uh, amazing Discord channel is, is someone said, um, "When it comes to method method acting, isn't it weird that no one ever methods a nice person?" Absolutely, uh, it's absolutely true. It's just an excuse to just to be mean to people I, around you. I don't know if I've told time. this. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Okay. Ro- often, often Robert Pattinson, I think, is the one who who's attributed to that quote because uh, yeah. I think he was very anti-method. I don't know if I've told this story on the podcast, but it's really stupid. I was once like pitching the show to the head of Sky Television in a terrible London club 
used to be called it's called the hospital club and it was this absolutely like nightmarish nathan barley <laughs> style oh, wow. like, media hangout amazing and i was i was pitching my ridiculous uh, unfilmable idea which i shouldn't have been doing to the head of um, sky drama and and he, we were sitting at a table in this place and over the shoulder of the head of sky drama was tom hardy sitting at a table uh, <laughs> behind a laptop except he stopped looking at the laptop basically as soon as i started talking and then just glared at me uh, oh, no. the entire time i was trying to pitch my <laughs> idea for a he's got a, he's got a scary glare as well he's for, got an incredibly <laughs> scary glare. It, was, it was so distracting <laughs> to have tom fucking hardy like glaring at me like what are you fucking what's this idea about like wizards what's this and about? pop music yeah he was just like, <laughs> i almost wanted to like get up and say tom d- mate do me a favor please, please. St- stop frowning furiously at me um <laughs> So yeah, anyway, I could really digress there. But that was really distracting. Imagine trying to do anything while Tom Hardy is ferociously frowning at every word you're saying. It basically makes it impossible. No, that's a, that's a terrifying idea because um, there's a... Sorry, the, I, this, I will end this digression soon, which I started. <laughs> but um, Tom Hardy, uh, I think for international listeners, uh, called like the CBBS stories. And CBBS is, uh, the BBC does uh, programming for children. And it's uh, basically... Uh, a, a beautiful respite for parents who could just sit their kids down to watch some uh, just safe programming <laughs> for a bit. Um, uh, but they did for a while. Uh, I think they're still doing it, like bedtime stories. Yeah, uh, yeah, they've been they've been doing it for years. Yeah, they've been doing it for years. Um, except, like after a while, there became like a dual purpose to them, where they would <laughs> they would get uh, extremely attractive uh, actors, uh, famous actors to slightly seductively read <laughs> a bedtime story uh not in a way that you know any children would ever detect but like just for the mums and dads who are watching <laughs> um and tom hardy did one um and it, uh, jamie it was quite scary <laughs> i think he's quite a scary guy oh based yeah based on his uh, on film like on screen persona oh yeah no i've i've seen it and i, I think there were quite <laughs> a few mums and probably a few dads as well who were rather enjoying him Oh, yeah, the yeah. camera and saying, "Go into bed. <laughs> you're up. You're up too late. Get into bed." Um, uh, I saw a few humorous gifts to that effect of uh, young women catapulting themselves into bed. He, at those words, <laughs> he knew what he was doing, and uh, everyone involved knew what they were doing. Absolutely, and they should be thoroughly ashamed of themselves. <laughs> bring that filth onto the airways. Uh, uh, what's, wrong with, uh, what's wrong with Mister Tumble? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm um, so so sorry to pull us so far off the point. Um, I wanted like, what have you been uh, playing recently, Jamie? So I have been playing Resident Evil Four Remake oh, on one. my PlayStation. Um, yeah, it's great. What a great game! Um, mm. I've had a Resident Evil Four kind of year because I replayed the original um, uh, around about the time the remake first came out, actually, and I played it with the fantastic HD texture pack which you can find online which was made by some absolute genius i think a a couple maybe or a a sort of two people uh together who sort of what they tried to do was what they did do basically even though it took them the best part of a decade was rebuild all of the textures from the original resident evil 4 for the steam release and uh, replace them with these beautifully up versions of them it's massive mm. like the game itself is like eight gigabyte and then the the texture pack is like 40 gigabytes or something it barely fits <laughs> on the steam deck but it's absolutely worth the download and slight faffiness of getting it up and running because it's one of they've done that thing where they've made it look like how you remember it like when yeah. you play the game resident evil 4 without the texture pack it sort of looks you know it looks like you know it's, it's still a masterpiece but it looks like a 20 year old game you know but with this hd texture pack on it which they they've done like amazing work on just about every single artifact um an asset in the game it just it's just like a real dream to play mm-hmm. um the, the details that they've added all really subtle they haven't gone like crazy on it they've just done enough to kind of really bring it back to life uh, with a huge amount of respect for the original game um so that was a real experience in and of itself 
Um, and that guy, I think, who did it has now been hired by Night Dive Studios to kind of work on uh, nice. proper games and stuff like that. But he did stuff like going to Spain to like photograph stuff um, that the original Resident Evil 4 team had used as references and then using mm. his own photographs to recreate stuff that was lost. Amazing. I, I just find nerds like that so impressive and uh, uh, glorious. So I played that game, and that game remains, yeah, a masterpiece. It's brilliant. Um, if you sort of put the ridiculous plot to one side it's still just a wildly exciting game to play the pacing of it is remarkable you know it has this ability to kind of keep leveling up itself keep one-upping itself you know yeah and when you play it today it takes a moment to get hang of the fact that you can't move and shoot at the same time (laughs) you have to just sort of stand still and do it but once you've got your head around that yeah it still feels really current it's still an absolute blast to play through and all of the post-game stuff is really enjoyable you know the fact that you can just sort of keep playing it forever try and get better times try and get your infinite rocket launcher that costs a million gold or whatever it's like there's all sorts of like, yeah, uh, all, all the mercenary modes, the the extra modes with um, a- Ada and all that kind of stuff, which they've obviously re-released uh, a new version of that now, which I hear is brilliant for the new one. It's just a it's just a really great game, as everyone knows. Hmm. Um, and it's interesting to play the remake. Um, the remake is also really really good. Leon's hair, my god, <laughs> Leon's hair looks good, and the game starts. Like the moment you take control of Leon, they give you so much time to just look at his hair <laughs> <laughs> and his gorgeous jacket. Um, this really enviable jacket he's wearing at the start of the game with uh, mm. lovely kind of um, fleecy shoulder pads. That I just so wanna... it's, it's, it's that amazing. Um, so the hair in particular, like it, it, it's it's a, a set of parting that looks like a, you know a noughties or just late nineties boy band kind of kind of look. But the, Absolutely, uh, yeah. The, he looks the, like the, there's a team of people who have just finished putting their final touches yeah. on it before he I, steps out of the car into the Spanish countryside. He's supposed to be a kind of like, uh, I don't know, a member of special forces on behalf of the president, um, yeah. looking for the president's kid, and and he shows up with this with this haircut, and it's it's become like part of I don't know part of that game, <laughs> weirdly. Absolutely, the haircut. I mean, it's funny because Ashley has got the same hair. <laughs> yeah, a different she haircut. She's got the same hair, which I guess it's is just an asset. An asset. <laughs> yeah. I mean, her her outfit. I don't know what is going on with that. I am not one to criticize the costuming <laughs> usually, but like she's wearing like a like sort of tartan shorts, and then a kind of roughly silk shirt. I don't know. She just looks weird. I don't know what she was doing <laughs> she when she was actually. when she was kidnapped, but it's like <laughs> it's it's something odd. She was it was like a Renaissance ball or something. Anyway, or, or like a flapper club from the thirties. <laughs> a little bit. I don't know. Like, yeah, you're right. I, I see what you mean. It's very. It's a. It's a strange outfit. I mean, you can change them all to kind of lots of ridiculous um, outfits as well with the with DLC. I saw a streamer mm. uh, dressing Leon up as a kind of yeah, looks like a kind of gothic like vampire monster thing. You can change oh, yeah. it to really stupid stuff. Although nothing quite beats the uh, mod for Resident Evil 8 where you can change the baby at the beginning of that game to have <laughs> Chris Redfield's face. <laughs> Which is just, I, I, re- I recommend anyone watch that. It's so funny. I started laughing before you finished that sentence because <laughs> that just kicked up that image right into my mind just immediately. Yeah. Chris, baby Chris Redfield is just great. Anyway, uh, Resident Evil 4, yeah, it's mm. it's brilliant. I mean... I don't think it's obviously it looks gorgeous and looks you know absolutely like a, a game from this year. It's 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 interesting to me about thinking about how much it it obviates the previous game or makes the previous game not worth playing because I don't think it <coughs> does. Funnily enough, it doesn't feel like it's a replacement for that game. It feels like it sits alongside it quite nicely as a sort of alternate experience of it. Hmm. But I would still like definitely recommend people play the original game um as well as as well as uh, the remake um which i which i'm surprised by i don't know it seems like it seems like the remake is such a good example of what they've been doing now for quite a few years now which is making these you know really really excellent versions of their original work yeah um 
but I, I think it's a success actually. I think it's a successful thing they've done where they're the right amount of respectful and disrespectful to their material in a way that doesn't kind of obviate or, or make their previous work, you know, somehow irrelevant. I think it's sort of testament to the to the skill of them really. I'm playing find, it on um oh please go on. Um I was really interested I think you're particularly right about the pacing of the the original. And that's something that playing the remake, which I agree is like a really like impressive version of that game, I do feel as though the pacing is soft a little bit. And I've been really trying to put my finger on how. Um and I think like uh, why I think the the stuff like slightly overextended uh like roller coaster sequences at points um and moments where perhaps because just having played the previous game there's a bit, a mi- bit of mystery is lost um where for example the alligator fight in the lake um it just feels like less surprising and a bit overextended and i'm not sure whether that's too much familiarity on my part with the original or whether something has suffered in the transition between this this game like the original uh, and this game um i don't know like and also they've changed some of the boss fights as well and some of the original boss fights were not good so it's probably reasonable to you know reinvent them for a modern audience but i don't know there's something about like the pacing in particular to me that has like it feels different yeah, I think I think I think that's exactly it. I think it is because they try and sort of lean into the spectacle um a bit more and kind of lean into the the sort of um you know, the kind of the, that feeling of being in an action movie and in a kind of rolling action sequence that keeps one upping itself and, and uh, you know that kind of thing. Mm. And I think I think if it wasn't for the fact that they've like managed to update the combat sort of stuff and the shooting to right. f- to kind of be a, a progression on from that i think that makes the kind of lack of you know the slight difference in pacing and the slight deficit in pacing i think that kind of makes that fine though because it's still so much fun to kill things in this game yeah um, that, that i think it's i think it's just a, it just about works out okay on that front i could have i think it could have been a much bigger problem if that wasn't the case i think people would have been getting a little bit bored or finding it a bit tiresome perhaps um one thing I'd say is that I I decided to play on hardcore mode. So it says on the it gives you three mm. difficulties, and one of them says if you've played Resident Evil before, you should select this mode, which is hardcore. Um, which I've been playing on. Which like I read a headline earlier, which described it perfectly. It doesn't fuck about hardcore mode. It's really it's really <laughs> difficult. Um, uh, beautifully difficult, actually. I I, I think that's mm, been cool. the thing that's really impressed me is that it has in fact recreated the feeling of playing the original game um in that i am always in this state of absolute scarcity like i'm every single yeah. like uh encounter i win by the skin of my teeth after failing it several times in a row um i've always got like two bullets in any given gun and every single bit of currency or resources or anything like that that pops up is absolutely like required uh collection and it makes me like think really carefully about the weapons I upgrade um, and just makes me think more carefully about the game in general, about, about the decisions I'm making and, and, and you know, the activities I'm kind of taking on. And I think, I think if the game had been, if I, I wonder if I'd played the game on normal difficulty, whether that would have been the case. I wonder if I would have sort of slightly steamrolled through it and not sort of taken the time to appreciate some of the, the kind of stuff that's going around on around the edges of the game, perhaps. Yeah, that's re- that's really interesting. So I remember, like, my experience with the original game. I played on the GameCube. I think when it came out, like, it was actually weirdly hard to find. But I remember sort of going to a random CEX and pick up a, the little disc. Uh, and actually, so for example, the melee attacks were super important. Um, the suplexes and the sort of silly animations that you get actually. Uh, but like the fact that you're doing that and rushing towards enemies and putting yourself into danger because you don't have the ammo to otherwise solve the problem. Um, 
and that is like a, a, as well as the slow turning circle and a lot of stuff that would seem i think clunky and sluggish i think there was they i don't think i think they stumbled almost accidentally on something very very good <laughs> in in the original resident evil 4 the combination of all the all of those forces making you feel af- afraid and desperate uh, was always like a part of that game like in almost every sequence uh, that I can remember. Of course, like uh, actually, I think there is a demo for the new one where you get to play the original, like the, the first village, which itself is a fantastic mini uh, mini sandbox, mini combat sandbox where you're jumping through windows, uh, blocking doors to stop hordes from coming in, trying to manage uh, the crowds coming at you. Uh, also, uh, finding occasionally much better weapons like a shotgun is just a huge thing to get in that game um and then you get towards the end of the village and uh enemies heads start exploding and turning into giant tentacles <laughs> <which are> the, <laughs> uh, and then suddenly you need flashbangs to explode them and it, it's a really good combat game actually like uh, you've reminded me of how, how how much depth there is to weapon selection um the upgrades that you choose the way enemies are designed the fact also that enemies take locational damage in really interesting ways uh, so if you uh, shoot an enemy in the shin uh, so, uh, sometimes they could be stunned so you run forward and then you can do a close combat attack um, and that uses no ammo uh, and it eliminates them so then it's kind of yeah actually uh, that's probably what you want to do sometimes except for when there are, there's a guy with a chainsaw <laughs> <laughs> just behind them who will just chop your head off immediately. So, yeah, it's it's fantastic. I love how it makes you think on your feet. And, mm. I mean, like, it gives you a quick slot swap uh, function, which the original game was sort of sorely missing. But yeah. I find myself, when I sw- switch weapons, I do still pause in the old school way I, like i don't use the quick uh, switch because i need that moment to just kind of gather my <laughs> gather right. myself to kind of what i'm going to do uh next anyway um yeah and I, I think the way that like as you say they introduce all these kind of different varieties of enemies all of which require slightly different um you know ways of, of defeating them again this was something in the original game that but i think they've iterated on all of those things in really interesting ways and definitely like the amount that i'm having to rely on my like little parry you can parry a chainsaw in this game which is kind of glorious um my parry button and the stagger and uh you know stabbing enemies with the knife when they're down all that kind of stuff it, it it builds to a pretty glorious rhythm, I think. Mm. Um, that's very reminiscent of the of the original game, but kind of massively updated. So yeah, I think it's um, and also it's it's just a game that you can just stand in a room and look around, and it just looks it look, badass. Look really. it just looks really, really cool. Yeah, it looks awesome. There's so much detail, and like you can wander over to kind of you know, um, you know, pretty much any little knickknack or anything like that and, and just see some real artistry on display. And mm. I just, yeah, that's really great. So yeah, I'm kind of towards the kind of final act of that game. I, uh, I'm looking forward to like beating it, having a break and then going in and playing the uh, uh, separate ways DLC, which I've, I've seen a bit of and uh, on YouTube and really enjoyed that as well. Like that looks mm. great. Um, I think uh, I know that the actress who plays Ada in this game got a lot of stick online because she is a woman in a video game and isn't mm. wearing the cocktail dress that <laughs> Ada is some, oh, for some reason wearing sake. in the original game. I think she left Twitter. But I think she's really good. I think she gives a really interesting performance in a game that doesn't really have any of them. So <laughs> I was, <laughs> I'm really excited to kind of play as her, actually. I think uh, it sounds like, in that sense, it is largely true to the original. Like, like. I, I didn't notice that any of the voice actors were particularly bad at all in uh, the remake, but in the original, yeah, they're famously like just honking into a microphone, and then it's been <laughs> captured in like eight bit audio that isn't stereo, and it all sounds weird. Like someone's calling you over uh, a walkie-talkie to tell you about <laughs> zombies. No, not quite. Interesting what they'll do next. Actually, I'm, I'm wondering yeah. about that because obviously, like Resident Evil Five. Is, Don't do that one. Uh, my, my, this is my prediction: is that they're going to <laughs> they're going to do they're going to redo Resident Evil Five. Um, oh, no, but I think they will change the location of it um, 
and okay. kind of do a do a kind of course correction version of that game. So it will be almost like the Final Fantasy uh, Seven remakes, you know, where they kind right. of at a certain point they diverge. Um, they they really would need that, otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> don't make the game. Probably, it's so funny that at the time there was all this like really like introspective debate about like is this racist or is this actually oh, it's just clearly racist <laughs> it's just it's clearly like, is this really not racist? is this actually anti-racist is this an anti-colonial piece it's like no, it, it's it, a racist piece it, it, yeah, stop it, saying it, things <laughs> how was that how yeah i mean yeah yeah so we're being a bit coy here but um if you haven't played resident evil 5 there are don't. bits where <laughs> that, that obviously don't um it's just because it, it, it's obviously it's actually a boring game but like there are bits where you just go into uh, villages in Africa and shoot up, um, you know, uh, tribal black people, and it's just uh, caricatures, and it's just not. It's, I mean, I've said enough already. Apparently, <laughs> apparently someone, it, apparently someone at Capcom had seen Black Hawk Down, and okay. thought that's what we should do. Now I don't know if you've seen Black Hawk Down. Um, yeah. I mean, it's great. It's very exciting, but no one's going to stand up and say that that movie isn't pretty problematic about the idea of <laughs> well, it's arriving, like, so in, like, arriving oh, in a foreign country and sort of killing everyone you see. You yeah, know, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's just. Um, I think the execution in particular, just visually, as you're going around those villages and you're just executing people, it's actually it's genuinely horrible. I, I've, yeah, I've, it just feels wrong, and it's amazing it's really if you look upsetting. back at the, yeah. the discourse from back then, which is kind of quite thoughtful. You know, and people trying to justify it. Sort of people from all, all walks of life and all backgrounds yeah. kind of justifying it, you know. And actually, and it's one of those things that, in, with the benefit of hindsight, absolutely, it just feels very wrong indeed. So, yeah, I think they're going to do Resident Evil 5 remake, but they're going to, like, retcon, remake it, set it somewhere else, and do it as a kind of, like, yeah, let's write the write the wrongs of the past. And Because uh, Resident Evil 6 is a kind of completely batshit mental... Uh, you know, oops, all characters, you know, kind of finale for the sort of storyline that's introduced in those games, hmm. which I don't think they'll bother to remake. So my guess is they'll, this is this is literally just pure speculation. I don't have an in at Capcom or anything. Um, but I think they're going to do a remade Resident Evil 5 that, that yeah, like tries to sort of, they're going to do a remade Resident Evil 5 that tries to answer some of the problems of, the original one and then after that they're going to go off in a completely different direction with the series um and do like uh, yeah mad shit uh, uh, along the same line well, that's one of the things that resident evil is really good at is just changing almost changing genre um like seven was a really quite intense first person uh horror game with shooter elements and that, that was quite a departure um I think what they might do in line with current trends is just to remake Resident Evil 8 again. <laughs> because the time uh, between the current releases and uh, the remakes like, is getting shorter and shorter. Um, and I think, like, 8 is fine and popular, but I, I know it'd be funny if they, if they did that for the next generation of consoles in a couple of years. <laughs> That might well be what happens. Yeah, it'll be interest, interesting to see because I think they've been on absolute fire for the last few releases. I mean, I've loved the, you know, the Resident Evil 2, 3 uh, remakes. Um, yeah. seven, 7 and 8 have got a terrible lead character but have a lot to, you know, say for them. And yeah, so it should be interesting to see what they see what they do next. Um, it's a great series. And uh, speaking of great series, um, <laughs> and as a, a complete tone shift, uh, I believe we've both been playing a bit of uh, Super Mario Bros. Uh, Wonder. Yeah, been playing a bit. Played a couple of hours of it, in fact, yeah. I'm on uh, World 2 at the moment, so very early days, and it's kind of, yeah, so what were your first impressions so far? We'll probably come back to it in a few episodes. Yeah, I think uh, it's this weird thing with Nintendo, because for years... I would kind of hear people waxing lyrical about what a masterpiece Super Mario Brothers uh, world was Mm. Um, and Mario 64 and Super Mario Galaxy 2, all games I'd played a fair bit of and I just couldn't see it. I couldn't see this kind of incredible magic that people were were talking about. 
uh, that they found in all of those games. It just eluded me a little bit. Yeah. And what it took was um, Super Mario Odyssey, uh, which again is a game I didn't like adore, but like it kind of was a really good gateway drug into uh, into Mario itself because I enjoyed that enough to kind of go back into some of those games. And yeah, Odyssey was a kind of weird like Rosetta Stone for unlocking what was good about those games. And I now see I played pretty much all of the kind of big mainline uh, kind of releases, including Mario 64, which there is a brilliant like fan D pack that you can play on your Steam Deck um, mm. with all sorts of weird options. So yeah, basically I'm a, I'm a late in life convert to the magic of Mario. I think my favorite Mario game is Super Mario 3D World, which is a great version of on the oh, Switch, yeah, yeah. Um, which comes with that Bowser's Fury thing, which is also really good. Fantastic and, heart game as well. Yeah, like, really great. Oh, brilliant. Person. And I, I feel like Super Mario Wonder is very much in that lineage. It feels like in the kind of tradition of, uh, yeah, Super Mario uh, Galaxy and Super Mario 3D World. I think it is the same like team behind those games, hmm. um, which is to say, just like joyful, <laughs> yeah. a real expression of joy and wonder, as they've called it. It's 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 really going for that stuff, um, and I think I think the standout stuff in there is the sort of wonder sort of sections in each level which change something kind of fundamental about the reality of the level you're playing in so yeah. far it's included like musical sections or like mad uh, sort of extra enemies arriving or the physics of the world changing and yeah that just feels like a really kind of compact version of the sort of uh, you know playful joyful take on on kind of different level ideas that they've done in those those games that i've mentioned um so yeah i think it's i think it's really great i'm, I'm gonna play the whole thing i think um it just feels like a really generous sumptuous 2d experience which i think is all too rare these days um yeah it just feels really good <laughs> and really full featured yeah uh, i think one of the things so i loved mario as a kid playing on the snares just because it was a fun cartoon world and um, the actual acts of sort of jumping and bumping into um, blocks above you to get a mushroom and get bigger and then stomp on a Goomba was is just fundamentally a, just a very fun thing to do uh, as a new, a new player to video games. Um, but I think one of the things that, like, Mario Galaxy, the first one for me, really revived the idea that every single place you visit can have just different design ideas um, and different aesthetics from moment to moment and that you can blast out of that and go somewhere else very quickly and there'll be it might be a boss fight on a, a very small desert uh, planet or, or you could boss, you know blast out to a different place which is a nice planet where your movement is different because you're slipping around uh, the ice and you're also trying to get these collectibles and you're also trying to uh, still jump on goobers and uh, get acrobatic moves to get to new places and um that stuff is part of the delight of mario for me and wonder does have that in spades i think just the levels are quite short um but within the confines of supposedly 2d levels there's loads of like invention so f for example you could um hop into a pipe and then um the 2D Mario games rely on like parallax, parallax scrolling as you're going across to give the impression of depth in in the world that you're traveling through. Um, but sometimes in uh, Wonder, you can go into a, into a pipe and you will appear in a pipe deep in the background, like uh, in the mists, just like several layers back uh, in the level. And still be able to do stuff and you know pick up little wonder seeds, pick up little bonuses, pick up a mushroom, and then hop back in. There's that's just loads of innovation and clever ideas built into it. Like and it's relentlessly colourful, and you're moving through locations so quickly all the time. Um, I've I've found it to be just uh, just a beautiful game so far. Um, uh, I'm only on world two. But there's, I'm really excited to see what's going to happen next. And this is really have you tried it out in uh, co-op? Yeah. Um, so not in co-op directly, 
but I do go on uh, online to get the ghosts. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it, you can play as different characters, and some of them have like slightly different abilities. So, for example, I've been playing mostly as Toad, and he can sort of see certain blocks if he jumps near them that other characters can't see. And uh, like there, are, there's kind of like a bit more depth than I realise in like who you choose to play as. And also, uh, there's another mechanic called badges, where you unlock these badges that you can only equip one at a time. Uh, but they are basically like really important traversal mechanics sometimes. So, for example, there's one that lets you float as you jump. There's one that lets you jump a bit, jump a bit higher and then pause for a moment. Um, there's another that lets you uh, jump against a wall and then wall jump directly up- upwards, gives you an extra wall jump, essentially. Um, and this is kind of, it's probably my main beef with the game so far, um, is the fact that I, f- I feel as though, like, portioning those out as individual badges doesn't feel like Mario to me. It feels as though those should be kind of skills built into your character. <laughs> and the levels, you know, should, instead of having to sort of do trial and error to discover which badge you should equip to get the best stuff in the level, it feels as though you should have all the options available and then be able to explore and discover using all the tools. Yeah, it's interesting, um, isn't it? It's almost like a, it almost feels like a, metroidvania kind of mechanic doesn't it of like yeah it doesn't feel like mario to me no it feels it does feel a bit unusual i agree um uh but then again i think there's always been that aspect to mario of kind of trying to find the sort of uh breaking points in the level isn't that i know that's definitely mario world has that kind of you know various ways in which you can break levels and skip levels and and, and find different routes through them and i guess it's uh it's an attempt to kind of do a new version of that but um I agree that it does. It does feel a little bit strange to be, kind of. There's, there's something about Mario which is about like I always liked in 3D World, and you have that ability here where you can carry around an extra power up with you, um, mm. and and sort of deploy that. Uh, you know, if you if you require it, and I always thought that was a nicely simple way of of kind of uh, giving yourself an advantage in a given moment. Um, and this feels like, because uh, it has that system as well, and perhaps the the badge system feels a little bit like a hat on a hat, as it were, mm. uh, because you already have these abilities. You know, you already have your elephant <laughs> ability. Um, Absolutely. Mm. It's worth calling out some of the animations in this game, which just yeah. so gloriously detailed and, and amazing, like... The animation, the animation of if you crouch and crawl while you're the elephant, Mario, is just a joy and a wonder to behold. It's just fantastic, you know. And the fact that Mario like reaches back and grabs his hat when he goes through the pipe and all that kind of <laughs> yeah. stuff. It's just, it's just so, um, it's like, just so much work has gone into these tiny little moments that build to this really fantastic feeling uh, world to play. Yeah, no, it'll be a good one to check back in and well, in a couple of weeks, perhaps, and see where we've got up to with it. Yeah, uh, I think like perhaps after a bit of you know experience using the badges and stuff, I won't mind it so much. Um, but to be clear, it's not a, a at all a, even a minor problem with the game. It's a, it, you know, a riot of color, uh, fantastic music, and just you know you could just explore solo without even having having to dip into car but it's it's great there's also that thing isn't it where you can treat you can sort of treat the levels uh on two on on sort of two different um you can take two attitudes into the level right you can mm-hmm. just go like oh i want to play through this and 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 get a good time and just blast through it and see the kind of fireworks or i want to kind of explore and delve deep and fiddle around with the systems in here and it will reward that too yeah. and the fact that the game gives you like a menu to easily swap to different levels really quickly rather than having to run around the map is just like yeah it, it wants you to enjoy those levels exactly how you want to enjoy them i think um and i guess you know if you can avoid that kind of feeling of fomo with the the kind of extra hidden stuff then yeah i think it, it does feel quite liberating actually to not have to uh, worry too much about you know optimum play that the levels are kind of janky and bonkers enough to just let you have fun yeah i think it, that's a really good way to approach the game is just to blast through it and just see everything and really enjoy all the different sort of characters and personas you can become and um not worry too much about like the 
you know the wonder seeds and things that you need to collect because if you're just playing the game normally you'll you will get them it, it seems as though it's beautifully designed to just facilitate easy play like you know. Yeah, but they've then, done this for a few games now. I think Bowser's mm. Fury had the thing of like you only needed fifty cat shines to complete it, but there's a hundred in the game, so it's right. like it, that just like besects the game nicely between mandatory and non-mandatory, yeah, and means sure. you have so much freedom for how you tackle things. Because if you get bored of doing trying to get one thing, you can just go and do another. And I think, I think they have in recent years really nailed that kind of progression um although it's interesting to see, see this game has a like a proper old school life system mm. because for the last few games they've done a thing where you just lose a couple of coins and you use, lose a life which is meaningless essentially um so it's interesting to see them go back to having like literal life power-ups because i i was assuming that they would have they would be leaving that behind now but no here it is i don't know yeah. what actually i don't know what actually happens when you go down to zero lives i assume you don't lose all your progress <laughs> no i don't I, I don't know either because i basically that was so annoying i in one bout at a shop spent all my i can't remember what the coins are called but all of my money just stocking up on life um yeah you can get like, like five I, lives for a quid or whatever it's like it's they're, really they're, you can get loads and loads of them they're so cheap that I don't know why that's a mechanic. Like I, yeah. I don't know why you don't just give, give the player um, the lives um, to, to experiment yeah. <laughs> and, and wander around and do what they want. Yeah, it's strange, isn't it? Maybe the uh, game will sort of explain itself on that front as we get. Yeah, there. possibly. Again, like we're both only a few hours in, so like, yeah, yeah. these are very early thoughts. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I think that is all we have time for this evening. You can hang out with us and our community uh, on our Discord channel, a uh, link for which is on our website, uh, www.crateandcrowbar.com. Everyone there is lovely. We had a good chat today about the Alien movies, which I think we do about once every couple of months. <laughs> and it's always very oh, entertaining. Oh, I should get involved. I've not seen that. Oh, yeah, we, we were... We were I have many uh, opinions about those movies. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I, th I feel like, you know, video game nerds, people who have opinions of course. about <laughs> alien movies, <laughs> feel like there's an excellent Venn diagram going on there. So, yeah, that was very robust. And then it degraded into me just bickering with everyone about that Watchmen series, which, again, I think I do five or six times a year. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so there's that. Uh, yep, Discord. Um, uh, don't bother trying us on Twitter. We've lost the password. Um, but uh, we do upload these uh, podcasts as videos to YouTube, uh, www.youtube.com slash Crate and Crowbar. Uh, the Crate and Crowbar is kindly funded by our Patreon backers. If you'd like to know more about supporting our podcast and its various spin offs, patreon.com slash Crate and Crowbar. That's it. Uh, that's all we have time for. I've been Jamie Britton. I've been Tom Senior. And if you've ever been glared at by Tom Hardy, uh, do let us know and tell us the full story. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, get to fucking bed. <laughs>